Hello everyone. Today's webinar is focused on the basics of investing and stewardship. I'm happy to be here with you today as the founder of Koki LLC and, and hosting this event in partnership with Boba Talks, which is a free online community for students seeking career help. My name is Nayang Miller One, and I am just an average boba lover living in Seattle. I am not a certified financial planner. Um, my day job is working as a PM in tech, and my side gig or my personal project on the side is I run uh, Koki LLC, which is a small business based in Seattle, enabling young professionals and students across the world with their career and life goals. I've been employed full time since 2010 and I've had six jobs in the United States and Singapore. My earnings have been compounding interest since I finished college at the University of Michigan. I identify as Korean American, a small business owner, a homeowner, investor, and a deal lover. And my stewardship mindset is fueled by my faith. I'm excited to be here with you today to talk about a topic that I think really should be taught in schools and would love to connect with you all throughout this presentation to ensure that this meets your expectations. So today, over the next 50 minutes or so, you can expect us to cover the basics of investing, stewardship, setting goals for the short term, medium term, and long term, covering some case studies, and then of course having Q&A dispersed throughout the whole event. So let's start with investing all right so uh, i guess before we go there if you have questions throughout this conversation please and put them into this poll everywhere link poll ee sorry poll ev.com slash forward forward slash k-o-k-k-i i will be monitoring this page throughout and answering your questions as they come all right so when it comes to investing basics, I want to talk about the five W's and the how. So we'll start with why. Always start with why. So we'll start with why should I invest? The first is because you can, right? So if you have a part-time job, full-time job, freelance job, consulting job, um, any job, babysitting, tutoring, right? You have some money that you have the choice to spend or to save. That amount that you have is called disposable income. So that's uh, gross income, for example, $100 a month, minus the taxes of your government, minus the fixed costs of your life, minus the variable costs of your life, right? So fixed cost might be something like your predictable month, monthly rent. A variable cost would be something like how much you spend on food or entertainment, your, you know, boba <laughs> intake per month. And that disposable income, everyone has the choice of either spending it or saving it, right? So the fact that you have that disposable income is a place of great privilege that, in my opinion, is a responsibility for us to steward. Secondly, interest compounds over time, right? So the earlier you start, the better. And that's why even if you're just a college student, a high school student, first year out of school, you should start investing early. So what is investing? Investopedia defines investing as putting money to work for a period of time for some sort of project or undertaking in order to generate positive returns. It's the act of allocating resources, which is usually financial capital, with the expectation of generating an income, profit, or gains. Right? And when it comes to who should invest, you'll see here three personas. And the point here is that everyone should invest, regardless of your educational background, your employment status, how much money you make, and your real estate ownership situation. Everyone should invest. All right, so the question is, when should I start? And the answer here is as soon as you have disposable income. For example, when I was a student at the University of Michigan, my only source of income was really uh, the money that I made from my research assistant job at the business school. 
I was making something like $13 an hour, working maybe 15 hours a week. So I didn't get paid a lot, but I did have a little bit of excess after I paid my bills um, and enjoyed some meals with friends. So that was a good avenue for me to start investing my savings. Did I start doing that? No, I did not. <laughs> so I'm here to help you learn from mistakes or regrets that I have. Where should you invest? So there's many avenues for investment. The first is probably the most familiar. These are banks, brick and mortar banks like Chase, Bank of America, Wells Fargo, HSBC, and also online banks like Ally Bank. Uh, there's also credit unions that are in a local or regional focus like BECU here in Seattle. Um, you might have heard of, of platforms like Fidelity, Vanguard, Charles Schwab, Guideline. These are often uh, platforms that employers sponsor their employee 401k plans through. And then everyone is also welcome to create individual accounts on platforms like Robinhood, SoFi, and there's also more uh, futuristic or cryptocurrency based exchanges like Coinbase, Binance, etc. So for me personally, uh, I keep money at Chase Bank, LI Bank, Vanguard, Fidelity, um, Robin Hood, Charles Schwab, Coinbase, and I think that's it, right? I also have my health savings account in Optum Bank, and Optum was just the recommended bank by my employer uh, who took money from my t paycheck and put it into the potential health expenses account, which is called HSA here in America. Uh, when it comes to which one to choose, a lot of it is just preference. I would say the underlying principle is that you should seek the bank account with the highest interest rates, and that may vary depending on where you are living. So before you open an account, make sure you always research the highest uh, interest savings accounts or checking account in your region. So for me, Ally, uh, Ally Bank is what provided the most competitive interest rates for my savings, um, right now, here as I live in Seattle, before when I, was, when I was living in Michigan, as well as in grad school in Philadelphia. How can you measure success, right? So when it comes to success in investing, you have to think long term. This is not something that you, you know, yield overnight. It's hard to make money instantaneously. But if you think about growth over time, right, you will likely be successful. So some of you may have heard of the ratio 50%, 50, 30, 20, which is short for spend 50% of what you earn towards your needs, 30% towards your wants, and 20% towards your savings, right? And you'll see on this slide some examples of what fits into each category. The 20% of savings and investments is a category that some people choose inadvertently to keep in their checking account. Right? And that is a really, really big missed opportunity. So that's what I want to prevent from the listeners here today. Uh, and you need to diversify your portfolio to manage that risk. And it's very preferential based on your risk uh, adversity or risk profile. I also want to talk about spending because all of us spend money, right? And credit cards is a very strategic way to leverage your spending. So everyone should open a credit card if you are beyond the age of 18, mostly. Um, it helps build your credit, which is essentially your hi history or your credibility with financial institutions. So this is if you plan to take a loan in the future, a mortgage, um, a loan for a small business, right? They will check your credit. And uh, if you don't have a lot of credit history, then it will be hard for them to trust you. Secondly, you should research credit cards that align with your spending. A variety of options exist depending on your priorities. So one is to ask your friends or your family for referrals. Oftentimes that comes not only with the trust, but also with a special benefit, like a financial benefit to both of you. And lastly, when you spend money, please do not use your debit card. Your debit card exists so that your checking account has a physical card linked with it. So oftentimes when you need to pull cash at an ATM, that's what you'll need to use. But for daily spending, for groceries, movies, gas, you should really be using credit cards, right? So I pretty much don't even carry my debit card in, um, in, in my wallet at all, right? And um, credit card 
can be maximized for different categories. So I have a credit card that really um, benefits from a high grocery uh, cashback. So I use that Amex for, you know, that kind of spending. I have another one that's better for gas, etc. And I see a question here in chat. Um, is there a benefit to using multiple banks or different exchanges? Um, so that's mostly a, a strategy of diversification, right? Um, at the same time, it has to be balanced with um, how many accounts you're willing to hold, right? So for me, I spitball the long list of places I, I have my investments in, but I actually don't like the fact that I have so much so many different accounts open, I try to consolidate from time to time. So for example, um, when I used to work um, at a startup, my 401k was in a, a platform called Guideline, which is a common platform that startups use here in the United States. When I quit that job, uh, and this is a note to all of you, when you switch jobs, you can transfer money from your 401k, Roth IRA, into another investment platform investment account. So for me, because my first employer used Vanguard, I already had a significant amount of investments in Vanguard. And then my startup employer was using Guideline. And I didn't like that I had two accounts. So when I quit, I, I transferred my money from Guideline into my larger account, Vanguard, so that I would just keep track of one, right? So that's what I mean by balancing. Um, and it depends like how many passwords you wanna remember and whatnot. Thank you for the question, really appreciate it. And uh, speaking of questions, if you have any questions, please insert them in PolyV. I will keep an eye out throughout this presentation. Okay, this event was called Investing and Stewardship 101. So I do wanna cover this. So, <clears throat> If you have heard of Adam Grant, the psychology researcher at the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania, he has a book called Give and Take. And the premise of that, that book, in my words, is that successful people in life give more than they take, right? And I align very much with this philosophy. When it comes to what we have, we have time, we have treasures, we have talents. And at different seasons in our lives, we give a little bit of this, a little bit of that, and perhaps more of one or the other. And I think that's the combination of these three things that lead to impact, right? So what I would advise for those of you who want to live a generous life is to start giving early. If you don't start giving early, it will be hard to give when you have more, right? Um, and if I were to pull out like a quote from the Bible, those who have... Uh, been entrusted with little and are faithful with little will be granted more, right? But if we can't be faithful with little, then I don't know if we'll get more. I don't know if we'll be trusted with more, right? Think about the way that your family has treated you with their finances. And then as you give, I do want to just kind of give this practical footnote that there are tax benefits and deductions for charitable donations. So that's either money you can give, stocks, goods, in-kind donations, right? So it's just something to note as you go about that process. Okay, so the next section is about goal setting. And I'm gonna just take a, a break here to take a sip of water and also invite you to give some, some questions. Okay, goal setting is really important because if we don't um, think about what we're working towards, then I think we could easily get distracted or lose motivation. And um, in my view, short-term savings, mid-term savings, and long-term savings are all incredibly important. For short-term savings, you might be saving for emergencies or potential healthcare costs, like maybe you're thinking of getting an elective healthcare surgery like LASIK eye surgery, right? You need a good amount of money for that. Um, and the best thing about short-term savings is, is that things are very flexible or liquid, right? So for short-term savings, I like to keep money in a checking account and a savings account. But the savings account should really be a high-yield savings account, right? And for certain expenses, you can put money into a health savings account or flexible savings accounts, right? Um, so these are what, what financial institutions call tax-advantaged accounts, where uh, 
for the money that you make monthly or bi-weekly, they do not tax you for the money that you put into these accounts, which the government deems as kind of necess necessary for life. Midterm savings are planned purchases. So if you want to get a, a new car, want to pursue another degree, have a big celebration coming up, or want to take this like month-long Euro trip, <clears throat> or maybe you're saving up for your first, uh, first uh, house, right, down payment. So for midterm savings, um, I recommend, and I personally use things like certificates of deposit CDs, which are time-bound guaranteed interest rate um, savings that have higher yields than savings accounts, right? Um, and then there's brokerage accounts. So brokerage accounts are where you can buy stocks, bonds, bonds, exchange traded funds, mutual funds, like all these things, right? So the likes of Fidelity, Vanguard, Charles Schwab. Those are all great avenues for midterm savings. And lastly, long-term savings. Think of long-term savings more for passive income. So I think in the United States for the six jobs that I have held, um, what has been more common knowledge is the fact that all of us should contribute towards retirement, right? It's kind of like assumed that you would do that. So these are what in America are called 401k, 403b, Roth, IRA. And in Canada, I believe they're called Registered Retirement Savings Plans, RRSPs. And in every country, there's an equivalent of that, right? So if you max out your annual limit for these accounts, then you can also create a separate individual retirement account, IRA, right? So you can put more money into that channel as well, right? So if you look at the graph on the left, this is actually like an approximate um, split of how I keep my savings, right? So what I want to call out is that the majority of your savings should not be in your checking account or your savings account. It should really be towards the midterm and the long-term savings. And that's because the longer you're willing to commit and not use your money, the higher the yield you will get, right? Um, so when it comes to retirement, right, which is really essential for every job that you take, you want to first max out on the employer matches. So my employer, for example, Amazon, currently matches up to 4% of my eligible comp compensation that I elect as my contributions. So that means that if I contribute $100 a year, they will match 4% of that, which is $4, right? So I will be giving 100, my employer will give $4, so by the end of the year, I will have given $104, and then there will be, you know, positive gains, right, associated with uh, the money that I put in. Every employer has a slightly different matching policy. Some employers do not have a, a matching policy, but every employer will have a limit, right? So if you can, try to max out that limit, because it's essentially free money on the table. Secondly, you want to max out annual limits. So for the United States, 2023, these are the annual limits, right? So you cannot give more than 22,500 USD per year to your 401k, right? And Roth IRA also has, you know, its own guidelines depending on your age. So max out those annual limits. So once you've done step one and step two, then you can put money into a brokerage account, right? And brokerage accounts, you can sell at any time. It's not like IRAs where you have to wait until you're a certain age to pull money or that you get taxed heavily. Um, so tax implications for brokerage accounts kind of are contingent on how long you hold the stock or the asset, right? So in the United States currently, you must hold it for at least one year if you want to be taxed at the more favorable rate, right? And if you sell it quicker, then you will get taxed a higher rate. So that's what you have to think about with uh, any account that you take on. Okay, I want to spend some time talking about three case studies. And these three case studies are completely hypothetical. And by that, I mean not at all. <laughs> these are situations that I have talked to many A friends about. So first case study, uh, you could take a moment to read. It's about Christy and Jamie. Now I want you to calculate um, how much money that they will each have after five years in their 401k if you assume a 5% return, right? So they both make the same amount of money, but one contributes $0 and the other contributes $1,000 per year. 
So how much money would the second individual have after year five? Let's take a moment to do that. I'll pause here. And if you're listening to this recording, I would recommend that you pause this and take a few minutes, do some math on a piece of paper, on a post-it or, um, you know, notebook, and we'll come back here. All right, let's talk about this case study. So Jamie, the second example, is the fresh grad who contributes $1,000 per year for five years, right? So <clears throat> Jamie, uh, you know, she starts with $0. And every year she contributes $1,000, right? So her balance after year one when she gets a 5% return on $1,000 will be 1050. Next year, she starts with 1050, adds $1,000. So 2050 times 5% 5 is 103. You add that to 2050, she ends up with 2153. Keep going until year five, she ends up at 5802 USD. In comparison, um, Christy, if she had kept the $5,000 over the five years, not in this kind of 401k, the $5,000 would have stayed $5,000. But in actuality, it's not, it's not that it stays the same. It decreases in value because there's inflation, right? So $5,000 five years ago can't buy the same amount of cereal as it can today, or the same amount of yogurt or Mediterranean chicken. So this is why I encourage um, early investment with the, the concept of um, compounding interest. Second case study, let's take a moment to uh, do some of this math on a piece of paper. Again, I encourage you to pause to actually do these. All right, um, I finally got rid of the <laughs> chat function on the left side, apologies for hiding all of that header text before. Um, hopefully it's better now. So this second case study is about accruing interest and there's two individuals again. And the question is how much interest do these two individuals earn in their first year when they have two different interest rates, right? So Christy, $2,000 a month times 12 months is $36,000 a year. And that number multiplied by 0.01% interest is $2.40 per year. Jamie, same amount of money, but 3.3% interest is $66 per year. So that means Jamie is earning nearly 30 times more money through her passive savings account because she chose to go with a high yield option like at Ally Bank versus keeping it in her Chase Savings account, which she assumed to be a decent rate, right? So these are actually the rates that these banks offer as of two weeks ago, 2023, right? It is very common for brick and mortar banks to offer much less competitive rates than online banks, right? And it's not because online banks are not trustworthy. Ally Bank, I've been a loyal customer for more than 10 years. I can attest to its validity. I have not lost any money through it, right? But online banks, because they have fewer expenses, for example, they don't have physical stores, right? They, they spend less money on marketing, right? They're able to pass on those favorite, favored savings to their customers instead, right? So please do not keep your money in just a default low yield savings account. Last case study is about credit cards and I'll give us a few minutes to read through this. Okay, how much cash back do these two individuals receive per month? Let's do the math, right? 
So they're both spending $3,000 a month. Christy, because she gets 1% cash back on everything, ends up with $30 of cash back per month. Jamie, she's using a few credit cards strategically outline her cash back. So $1,000 of her groceries is getting 6% back, and then $2,000 is getting 1% cash back, so that actually yields $80. See the difference? It takes a little bit of work, right, to know which cards to use when, but I have gotten so much benefits and rewards, gift cards, airline points, by using credit cards strategically for my spending. All right, I will pause here to look at any questions within Poll EV. And as we wrap up, I just want to give four main points from our discussion. First is to invest your idle cash. It could be $1, $10, $1,000, it doesn't matter. Get started with investing. Secondly, seek progress, not perfection, right? So you don't have to be an expert to get started or open your first investment account. The, the important thing is that you are making progress. The fact that you're opening an investment account, the fact that you're putting your first dollar is a very big deal to celebrate. And over time, as you get more comfortable with the idea of putting money into an investment account rather than your checking account or your savings account, you can add more money to your liking, right? So my first stock purchase was one share of an ETF, VTI. One, because I didn't feel comfortable giving more, right? And now, you know, when I have savings, I buy like five at a time, 10 at a time, right? So you can, depending on your comfort level, choose. And you can do that all online. Um, you can do it uh, during market opening hours or after hours, really a lot of options here. Thirdly, spend what you, what you need and give what you can, right? So you can give of your time, your treasures, or your talents. Just give what you can and start giving early. And four, invest in things that last right so investing things that you believe will appreciate in value right so invest in shares or etfs that you think will grow in value over time invest in real estate if you think it will appreciate over time invest in watches if you think it will appreciate in time right there's so many things that fit in this definition of investment even though a lot of it was dependent or focused on you know money and shares today all right questions so i am going to give you all a few moments to submit any last minute questions on the poi view link and in the meantime i would really appreciate if you could give me some feedback on this session so here's a bitly link where you can uh, submit really quick like 30 second feedback on things you learned or found helpful throughout this session um, if you heard about this event through Bobotox, uh, you can find me on Bobotox. That's my uh, username. You can also contact me through my website, thekokki.com. And I want to let you know that there are a few other events coming up. So in February, we'll talk about finding your ikigai, a career of purpose, and uh, also an event about should you go to grad school. So join us again. You can find more details on our website. T-H-E-K-O-K-K-I dot com. That is all that I have today. Thank you so much for taking the time. And uh, please reach out to me via my website if you have any questions. Thank you.